Next, we'll talk about environment diagrams. So environment diagrams are a way for us to keep track of what's going on within the Python interpreter when it executes a program that we typed in. Environments are real things. So they're the way in which an interpreter for programming language keeps track of what names mean. So it's sort of memory that uh, keeps track of the bindings between names and values. So we're going to draw pictures of what they look like. And this will help you become a better computer scientist. Lots of what computer scientists do is draw pictures that involve boxes and arrows pointing to other boxes. It's just a huge part of the discipline, so you might as well start now. Okay, so an environment diagram is there to visualize the interpreter's process so that we can really understand how programs get executed. And they look like this. So you have some code on the left, and then you have some frames on the right. And the code is just regular Python code with some arrows to indicate where we are in the process of execution. And the frames keep track of the bindings between names and values. OK, so the code's on the left, the frames are on the right. Within the code, there are statements and expressions. So we see an import statement and an assignment statement here. The arrows indicate the evaluation order. So the gray one says, this was just executed. And the red one says, this is next to execute. It hasn't happened yet. OK, frames on the right show bindings between names, pi is a name, and values. So there's a name, there's a value. Within a frame, this is hugely important, this is part of the Python process. Within a frame, a name cannot be repeated. It has to be bound to at most one value. And we saw the consequences of this when we rebound the name max to a new number instead of the original function, the old binding was lost. Okay, so those are code on the left, frames on the right, and environment diagram. These are going to get more complicated, but also more necessary. Because when there are lots of names repeated in various ways, we'll need to be able to keep track of what they really mean. These things get drawn for you automatically. So uh, here's the web interface to what's called the Online Python Tutor. Um, so here's the code that we type in from math import pi. You can edit this. And then you t click Visualize Execution. And you get your code on your left and your frames on the right. And as you walk through each line of code by pressing forward, you see the consequences of executing. First, this import statement bound the name pi to its value. And the next thing that happened is that the assignment statement bound the name tau to 2 times pi. And here's the result at the end of the day. So when you're confused about what a program does, paste it in to the online Python tutor, and it will show you exactly what happens throughout the course of execution. That's the whole point. OK, so that's what an environment diagram looks like. Now we can talk about exactly what assignment statements do. They change the bindings between names and values in frames. So here is um, here's an environment diagram for three lines of code. Just executed was b equals 2. Next to execute is this larger assignment statement that has two names on the left and two expressions on the right. Now, there is an execution rule for assignment statements that you need to understand because Python always does the same thing over and over again. And here's what it does for assignment statements. It evaluates all of the expressions to the right of equals, from left to right. Then, after evaluating all those expressions, it binds all the names to the left of equals to the resulting values. So in this case, here are all the expressions to the right of equals. We get a plus b, which evaluates to 1 plus 2 is 3. So this evaluates to 3. B evaluates to 2. And then, second step, bind all names to the left of equals to the resulting values. So B will be bound to 3, and A will be bound to 2, the value of that expression. OK, so if we hit forward 
in the environment diagram generator, the just executed arrow will now be on line three, and the global frame will have A bound to two and B bound to three. Okay, so now we can do the complicated case that I asked you to solve by ourselves. Uh, let's just do it live in the Python tutor. Okay, so here was the question. What happens if I say f equals min, then f equals max, then gh equals min max, then max equals g, then this large nested call expression? Well, let's watch and see what happens. So the first thing that happens is that f is bound to min. This is the min function, a representation in the environment diagram that's similar to the angled bracket thing that you saw when Python uh, printed it out. Then we bind f to max. Now remember the rule that a name can be bound to at most one value in a frame. So since we've rebound f to max, we've lost the binding between f and min. That's just gone. Okay, now we say g and h are bound to min and max. So we evaluate min, that's the min function. We evaluate max, that's the max function. And we bind g and h to min and max. Notice there's only one min function, there's only one max function, but the max function now has two names, f and h. The min function has the name g. Now there's also the name max for the max function and the name min for the min function. Those are built in and they're part of the global frame, but we don't write them down because if we had to write down all the built-in names, then that would take up too much space. So we only write them down when they change, which is about to be what happens. So we next say max equals g. Using the execution rule for assignment statements, we first evaluate g, g evaluates to the min function, then we bind the name max to that value. So now max means min. Jeepers, that is complicated, isn't it? Okay, so then we say max of f of two, of g of h, of one of five, of three and four, and that involves evaluating all of these different operand expressions in turn. Before I hit forward, let's just watch how that goes. So we can draw an expression tree that evaluates the operator and operands of the call expressions and the operand sub expressions within them. So remember the rule for evaluating a call expression. First, you evaluate the operator, which in this case is Max the name refers to the function which minimizes. Then we evaluate the operands. The first operand looks like that. And we have to apply our rule for evaluating call expressions again. Evaluate the operator, evaluate the operands. This operand is complex. So we evaluate it. G refers to the min. We see that here in the environment diagram h1 and 5 is another call expression. We evaluate that by first evaluating the operator. h is the max function. 1 and 5 are 1 and 5. And so the max of 1 and 5 is 5. Now we take the min of 5 and 3 and we get 3. Now we're going to take the max of 2 and 3 and we'll get 3. And then we'll take the min of 3 and 4 and we will get three, which is the value of the whole thing. Congratulations if you picked 